welcome back once again. And we've passed the halfway mark in our online symposium. And with that, our center of gravity shifts from Australia, Asia, and Europe over to the Western Hemisphere. And to take charge of this fourth session of our symposium on ecologies of mind, media, and meaning, hosted by the Institute of General Semantics. Pleased to turn things over to our moderator and chair, the, uh, who is presently a trustee of the Institute of General Semantics, as well as the president of the New York Society for General Semantics. And while we're at it, also the current president of the Media Ecology Association, Mike Plew of Manhattan College, which in honor of the map not being the territory is not in Manhattan. Uh, take it away, Mike. It's true, we're in the Bronx and that's a long story. Uh, hello everyone, it's been great to be here with all of you today. <laughs> um, where I'm sitting is, is uh, quite chilly and rainy, but uh, being in here with all of you feels nice and sunny and warm. Uh, so I'm grateful for the good company. Uh, we're gonna begin our next session called Feeling and Form. And as Lance mentioned, we've, we've reached the Americas uh, and uh, uh, we have four wonderful presentations again. You'll get to know each of the presenters one by one as they go. And I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to uh, introduce you to our first presenter, uh, Zingara Lofrano of the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil which is uh, also called Pukihio. That's my favorite cutest name of any academic institution I've ever heard. Uh, uh, and we're gonna be hearing about what boobs have to say. So with no further ado, please take over. Good afternoon. I'm just sharing my uh, presentation. Is it okay? Okay? Yes, okay. So, well, my name is Ingrid Luciano, as Mike said. I'm speaking from Brazil, from, from Rio de Janeiro, and I'd like to introduce myself first. I'm a journalist, a Brazilian, and also a feminist. And I think that's because I created What Boots Have to Say, uh, which is a project really special to me because combines two of my passions. One is watercolors, uh, I love to paint. And the second one, is stories of everyday women. Uh, as a journalist and as a woman, this is really important to me too. And first I'd like to explain the whole process of the project. On the first, um, something is weird in here. Okay. On the first, I um, interview an everyday woman. And at the same time, I draw their breasts. After that, I organize the painting and the interview into a final product. Uh, on the third, I send the final product to the interviewee for approval. And I only post on Instagram, which is the last step of the whole process, if I have the validation of the interviewee. For me, this is a big deal. But a funny question, is why I started to paint breasts. Uh, of course, I have some references. One is Frida Kahlo. Um, I started to paint first. I'd like to explain that. I started to paint about five years ago. And on, on my lessons, I was painting animals, landscapes, objects without meaning. But at the time I was, I had the feeling that I would like to paint something real, something about women. And I did that trip. I went to Mexico City on the same year and I was really impressed about Frida Kahlo's art. I was a fan, uh, but I was feeling like how she could create art using her life, including su suffering, illness. I was really, impressed and moved about her art. And I came back to Brazil thinking, I'd like to do something related, you know. My other reference is, is Rupi. She writes amazing poetry and one is really special to me. 
I would like to, to read for you because this is really inspiring to me. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm just trying to reduce. Yeah, now I get it. So let's go. Rupi says, I stand on the sacrifices of a million women up before me thinking, what can I do to make this mountain taller so the women after me can see further? So that's why I created what boobs have to say, because I really want to show reality, show women's reality as Frida Kahlo did. And I really want to make mountains taller so the women after me can see further. I, I showed this project first on the last Media Ecology Association, which happened in, happened in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, at Fuc Rio. And I was really encouraged by my advisor, Professor Adriana Braga, to show that project. It was my first year on my master's, and I got into my program with the idea to study WhatsApp. But after Media College Association, I realized that I could, uh, that I could uh, research female body using what books have to say as a reference. So after Media College Association, I decided to do this transition. And right now I'm reading a lot about female body. Today, I'd like to highlight some references uh, for scholars, you know, academic references. One is my advisor, Adriana Braga. She wrote a book about female Brazilian bodies. And she says, body is symbolic and cultural. It's not something natural, it is naturalized. And for me, this is an important point to understand all the interviews. Other uh, female researchers say, Women's bodies are historical targets of exploitation, retaliation, and punishment. And we can see uh, that point in offline and online environment. And other researchers say the body can be seen as social space. Almeida and Siqueira, they are, they are studying tattoos on the body and they understand uh, tattoos are codes full of symbolism and contests. Um, I think this is a good point to understand breasts too, you know? For me, breasts are codes full of symbolism too, and they receive different meanings according to time and space. So that's what I'm trying to investigate with the interviews. These are my references. Coming back to the project, it is available on Instagram. I have uh, 933 followers. It was created in 2020 on a Brazilian Instagram account. Um, there you can see 17 stories and paintings posted. And the stories are about maternity, self-love, self-esteem, birth changing, getting older, real stories. Uh, but the beginning, uh, the, pro the project started with few friends uh, and the interviews were face to face. But after showing up in an online magazine, the project grew and I started talking to women all over Brazil. Uh, because of that, the interviews were conducted online. Of course, I have some challenge during the process. The most important was the pandemic. As I said before, the project started one or two portraits before pandemic with few friends. But after doing the pandemic, in fact, the project took place online and it was really challenging because some women weren't comfortable with online security, which I totally understand. Because in Brazil, we, ha we had many articles saying uh, we had problem with Microsoft Teams and Zoom. So women weren't comfortable to show their bodies in, in a computer. But on the, on the other hand, the internet gives us the possibility of uh, interviewing women from all over Brazil. So I talked to women from many states. In fact, I did an interview with a woman who is, she's living in Portugal. 
So this was really nice too. Something that I would like to improve is about diversity. Most of the women interviewed were under 35. I was doing the interviews and the, the painting as I was receiving message, but I would like to have my, to add more diversity to the project. I would like to have older women, women of color too. And I think I have to improve that point. About the reception, followers were really supportive. They were commenting, displaying empathy, liking the posts. It's really beautiful, a really beautiful environment. But since the project was created, I received two sexist message, message not comments, uh, both from men. In Media College Association, I had the opportunity to show some of those material. As we are doing online, I couldn't think uh, in a ex uh, an exposition, but I brought one story, so I would like to read for you guys. I'm not saying the name of the interviewee. Any women is, I'm not saying, but I gave the title, My Daughter Told Me, and I'm going to read right now. I always liked my books, but after I started 30, I started paying attention, close attention to their change. I noticed that they were more down and that sometimes caused me anguish. I'd catch myself looking in the profile mirror and wondering if surgery would be something that would me, make me feel better. Today, at 32, I try not to self-harm. I cannot fall into this trap of perfection of this eternally young body. Over time, my body will change and I need to enjoy each phase. That has been my motto. Back then, I had some criticism about my body. And when I look at old photos, I realize how beautiful I was, how I would love to go back to that. But at, the, but at that moment, I also had questions. Maybe I didn't enjoy and love this body as much as I should have because I was always so critical of how I looked and felt as though I was lacking something, creating problems in something that is really wasn't. I have some self-image wounds that come from my childhood because I was chubby in my pretense. This ended up is filing over into my relationships with my body to this day. I'm watching from the outside and I have the feeling that my daughter, Anita, has more self-esteem than I did at that time. I started gaining weight at age, which is how old she is today. She has also grown through this fainting process, but unlike me, it is well resolved. From the time she saw me in a more dissatisfied moment, complaining about my body, she always tries to make me in the opposite direction. Nothing to do with it, my mother. Stop it. You are beautiful. I feel her as a support, a friend. Thanks so much. This was what boobs have to say. Thank you very much. It was uh, wonderful to see in person, and I'm very happy to see it again here in this environment. I hope others have some questions and comments for you. Um, we're going to move on right now to our good friend, Marty Levinson, uh, who in the program you'll see represents the Institute of General Semantics, as he has for a very long time. Brilliantly, uh, Marty is going to present When the Map is Not the Territory, General Semantics and Satire. Well, thank you for that kind introduction, Mike. Well, all right, the title, thank you. All right, so Mike told you the title, so let me begin the talk. General Semantics talks about the importance of making maps that accurately portray the territories they describe. With respect to satire, maps of territories are obliquely portrayed to make particular points. In this talk, I will touch on general semantics points, such as the problematic use of high-level abstractions, the way jargon can distort the way we perceive and think about the world, and how misinformation and false assumptions can lead people to act in self-sabotaging ways that are contained in three satires I have written 
and we'll be reading to you. They come from my recently published book, Lunch with the American People, Satirical Food for Thought. The first piece, which has the same title as the book, Lunch with the American People, highlights the weird use of abstractions in political discourse. I begin. Yesterday, I had lunch with the American people. I'd wanted to speak with them for the longest time as they are a highly influential group of folks, often mentioned by politicians on TV news programs. I met the people at a diner near where I live. I ordered a BLT sandwich with coleslaw on the side and a cup of coffee. The people ordered cheeseburger specials with double fries and Diet Cokes. I told the waitress to give everyone separate checks. After some idle chit chat about the huge portions of food typically served in diners, I asked the American people to tell me their thoughts on wearing masks and getting vaccinated to prevent COVID. They started to answer the question before I could finish it and the cacophony and contempt that individuals within the group had for those who did not share their views was certifiably crazy. Luckily, I had a whistle in my pocket and after blowing it as loud as I could, the crowd calmed down. It turned out 30% of the people thought mask wearing and taking shots to prevent COVID was a bad idea. 50% thought it was a good idea. 10% said it was a good idea on weekdays, but a bad one on weekends. 7% had no opinion on the matter. And 3% said the pandemic was fake news. I moved on to illegal immigration. Do you think a security fence should be built on the Mexican border? Do you support a guest worker program? Are you in favor of granting amnesty to undocumented individuals currently living in the United States? The people popped right in with answers, which they argued about forcefully with each other, some waving knives and forks in their hands. I worried it might get physical, so after blowing hard on my whistle, I told everyone to calm down and give a little thought to what they were saying. But I was advised that's not how Americans roll. One guy said, we are not a nation of deliberators. We know what we think and want to express our views quickly so we don't get confused in case someone interrupts us with different ideas. I pleaded with the people to keep their voices low, warning if they didn't, we might be asked to leave. That entreaty worked and was helped by having our food brought out from the kitchen. As the plates were being set down, the people began to argue about who should sit where. I said I didn't think it mattered where anyone sat, and while they were debating the issue, their food was getting cold. No one seemed to care about that, and the squabbling continued, so I took out my trusty whistle, gave it a blow, and said, how about we stop the bickering and just enjoy the meal? To which I was told, mind your own business and please pass the salt. I'd wanted to talk to the people about the economy, race relations, abortion, and a host of other topics, but I didn't have the strength to keep blowing my whistle. That a third of the American people were packing guns also made me wary to talk about anything that was controversial. So I decided to talk about something that was innocuous. Nice weather we're having, I said to my table mates. Meteorology was not the conversational safe harbor I thought it would be. Some of the people said the weather did not look nice to them. Others accused me of being a climate change denier. And a few demanded to know why I was talking about the weather when there were so many more interesting and important subjects we could talk about. Rather than respond to their remarks, I requested the checks. The checks totaled $2 billion, minus the tips. Not a bad price for 330 million cheeseburger special. The bad part was the only thing everyone agreed on was that I should pay for the food. I didn't want to fight such a petulant throng, so I agreed to pick up the tab, which did make me happy as the limit on my credit card was $10,000. I asked the waitress if I could pay with a personal check. She said I could as long as I had three forms of photo ID. Fortunately, I did. As I got into my car to go home, two thoughts struck me. The next time I speak to the American people, I will do it on Twitter, where you don't have to, feel, where you don't have to feed folks to get them to talk, and you can be as outlandish, unthinking, and as arbitrary as you like. And after my check bounces, I doubt if I will ever be welcome to eat at this diner again. The second piece I will read, Dinner at the Woke Street Cafe, illustrates how jargony type language can distort and compromise direct communication. Dinner at the Woke Street Cafe. When I enter the Woke Street Cafe, a hip new restaurant that caters to the woke, 
those wanting to be woke, and individuals curious about the idea of wokeness, I try to check my privilege at the door, but was told unless I agree to sign up to receive emails from Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and members of the squad, it would not be accepted. I thought that fair, so I clicked yes to the request when it came up on my cell phone. I was handed a status tag by the restaurant status attendant. I was then taken to my table, which was adorned with a plain, inoffensive tablecloth, politically correct cutlery, a recycled paper napkin, a list of grievances from people who have reached adulthood in the second decade of the 21st century, and a pamphlet on the merits of socialism. A white person brought me a menu and asked if I care to order a drink. I said I would and request he recommend something. He said the Cuba Libre was the beverage he was partial to as he hailed from Cuba and was a proud Hispanic who had married a Latina who was born in Brazil so she could not be called an Hispanic because according to the US Census Bureau, people of Portuguese or Brazilian descent are not considered Hispanic, but she didn't care because the majority of Latino Americans prefer to identify with their family's country of origin. I ordered the Cuba Libre. While sipping my libation, I looked over the choices on the menu, which included cisgender salad, that's a salad whose gender identity was assigned when it was prepared in the kitchen, biologically challenged potatoes, those are tubers grown in harsh conditions on the steppes of Russia, and gluten-free range vegan salmon, that salmon raised on vegetables without gluten in cage-free, filter-watered spawning grounds. I decided to go with a simple inclusive pasta that contained ziti, spaghetti, rigatoni, linguini, fettuccine, cannelloni, macaroni, rotini, and penne, served with a light sprinkling of garlic and olive oil and garnished with a disclaimer saying that the restaurant does not discount the nutritional importance of red and white sauce, nor the inherent value of pappardelle, orchietti, taglietti, and all the other marginalized pastas. To accompany my entree, I ordered a non-binary vegetable fruit dish that had in it cucumbers, pumpkins, um, tomatoes, and 10 other, in quotes, vegetables that botanically speaking could be considered fruits. For dessert, I ordered a BDS hot fudge sundae that featured chocolate sauce from the West Bank and nuts and rockets from Gaza. While eating my meal, I received a text from an LGBTQIAGNC neighbor who wanted to know if I was confused when they referred to themselves as they, which everyone in the Wokarati knows is a singular, non-binary, gender-neutral, reflexive pronoun used by individuals who are sensitive to the way our culture limits gender identification. I replied I was sure I would get used to the notion that they was an emerging pronoun that referred to a person who rejected the traditional binary he or she. They texted back they were happy I felt that way. And I was happy they were happy. And I felt even happier when they said they had recently met a very nice person whose individual gender was unknown. And they were taking themselves to Starbucks for a couple of double espressos and some indigenous non-gendered pound cake. After I finished my dinner, I signaled for the check. When I received it, I noticed an overcharge and told my server, who rather than being apologetic for the error said, okay, boomer, I'll get you another check. When I said his relevance to my generational cohort seemed somewhat dismissive, he replied, baby boomers have destroyed the economy and don't care about the future. So it's hard not to feel a a tad microaggressive when I serve an older privileged person like yourself. Not wanting to get into an argument with the waitron or be perceived as waiter phobic or systematically oppressive, I told the soup juggler to forget about giving me another check and that I would simply pay the full amount. I also said he might want to consider taking a course in customer relations and give trigger warnings when he attacked people. Sadly, my gesture of goodwill was not taken by the trade trotter in the spirit I had intended, and I was called a victim-blaming, socially misaligned, selectively perceptive, charm-free, negative attention-seeking, dysfunctional earth child, to which I responded, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can really harm me. If you are woke and not a joke, you'll find a safe space for me. The safe space turned out to be my car, which I drove home in feeling a bit shaken, but fully awakened to the idea 
that there was a lot about the woke generation and its lingo that I don't understand. And that in the interest of being less horizontally challenged and more sustainably fit, I probably should have just ordered the cisgender salad and mixed the dessert. Turnabout is fair play, and now that I've satirized the far left, let me apply a bit of satirical venom to some MAGA folks, that's M-A-G-A, who because of misinformation, bad assumptions, and their distorted maps of the world wreaked havoc in Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2020. Disloyal? I don't think so. The patriotic Americans who stormed the Capitol on January 6th did so because Congress was about to ratify the results of a presidential election where millions of illegal immigrants had mailed in votes from their vacation homes by the fields where they worked, and millions of would-be Trump voters were forced to stay in their houses by knife-wielding members of Antifa who tied them to their beds. And how about the fact that one man voted 800,000 times for Joe Biden? And that Donald Trump's name was not on the ballot in Arizona, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Georgia. What were these patriots supposed to do? Accept court verdicts from around the country saying there was no widespread voter fraud? Accept election results that were certified by each state as accurate? Accept the fact that Joe Biden won the election and electoral vote for president? I don't think so. This is America, where the facts are what you say they are. And if you get enough people to agree with you, you can become president. Congress was going to do the unimaginable on January 6th, declare the winner of the electoral vote would become president of the United States on January 20th. But what's up with that? Just because you win the electoral vote doesn't mean you become president. The original handwritten constitution had a secret provision in it that said, the loser of the electoral vote, if he's an incumbent and doing a great job, can remain in office as long as they can convince his base that the election he ran in was rigged and that the deep state is out to get white people. That's what happened here. In point of fact, Donald Trump should have been declared the winner of the 2020 presidential election in October 2020, and Joe Biden should have gone home to Delaware to play with his grandchildren. But that was not going to happen. Rather, the U.S. Congress was going to proclaim that a 110-year-old leftist pawn with delusions of grandeur and his evil black queen were going to become president and vice president of the United States. President Trump tried to right this injustice by calling for a rally of the supporters, people worthy of the Presidential Medal of Freedom and weekend discount rates at the Trump International Hotel in Washington, D.C., These people, perhaps best represented by groups such as the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and Three Percenters, wanted to stop the steal and save American democracy from degenerating into a play-it-by-the-rules operation. On the morning of January 6th, an army of liberty lovers got together peacefully on the Ellipse grounds in Washington, D.C., where they heard our wonderful president tell them, if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. In response, they marched to the Capitol and occupied the halls of Congress on behalf of the American people. This led to fake outrage by some Republican legislators who, because a few individuals died in the attack and some property was damaged, condemned the great Americans who sacked America's swamp-filled seat of government. But these turncoat Republican lawmakers should have focused their wrath on the true villains, people who voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, Two Marxist politicians who want everyone to have affordable health care, a decent education, and a worry-free retirement. Every Republican legislator should have praised the brave men and women who took the law into their own hands and tried to show the nation that spite makes right, white makes right, and the right is right about everything. That's been the Republican playbook since the 1990s, because when a party relies on a minority of voters, and those voters don't want their numbers to expand, it's the absolute right thing to do. Summary. Thanks for your indulgence and listening to my satires, and I have a request. Please put me and my fellow practitioners of satire out of business by applying the principles and formulations of general semantics in your lives. It's the absolute right thing with certain conditions and stipulations to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marty.
now that I know uh, what your credit limit is, next time we're at a diner, I'm getting two hamburgers and French fries and Coca Colas. Thanks. Pay for it yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Fine, fine. Uh, uh, (laughs) Next up, uh, we'll be hearing from Gina Valenti of Universidad Nacional de Rosario, Argentina. uh, And the title of the presentation is the wonderful Nancy Sinatra reference These bots are made for walking. Gina. Thank you. These boots are made for walking, and that's just what they'll do. One of these days, these boots are gonna walk all over you. Yeah. These bots are made for walking. Since the end of the last century, what we could not modify in our direct environment found its refuge online. The possibility of remixing ourselves to connect with others didn't make an attempt against the consolidation of a functional main identity. On the contrary, it facilitated a new environment where to migrate those traits that did not find their place offline. In every exodus, some enter through the same tunnel through which others exit, and they remain immobile, yet alert. Since we first connected, we passed through a door and never closed it again. Now we live in a confessional that knows it all. We used to consider that arrivals and departures suggest that we move from one place to another until we began to sit in front of a screen so that we can think ourselves in motion. Thinking has always been a way to break the force of the binomial space-time. Although in our culture, to watch our bodies move hasn't led us to understand time, but to accept that it justifies how operative we are in the system where we function. So scientists of centuries ago couldn't have imagined a human culture without bodies. But while while we were discovering new ways of fixing our biological machines, we were also building new ways to put them aside. In every civilization, shoes reveal the tasks that have warranted our survival through time. So we can adapt to hostile environments in ours. Do we need them to transport us when there is no need to walk? We are going through a process of rehumanization that is alien to us, but is our own. The human speaking with himself has forged his own nightmare. There is a fear of being the victim of one's own captivity in the opaque inheritance of intermediaries. In such horror, we can be language, dramatically good and grammatically dangerous. Today, deep generative modeling using neural networks has significantly improved the quality of conversational AIs by producing human-like responses in real time through advanced natural language models. In this type of technology, especially the latest chatbots, the lack of organic bodies is one of the most discussed matters when it comes to comparing them with human cognition. 
to experience high, we don't need to be born with wings. Can we affirm that creativity based on imagination is fully based on the perception of a world on a physical level? Bodyless, bodyless language can shape our minds as a book can change our behavior, as fiction series can install on us different facial expressions. If we resemble the way those creators intended us to look, then we were also designed according to their vision. Why should our creations have to look like us if we usually are used to look like them? What is the reason for our claim to emulate the human condition, to grant a body to something that exists precisely because it does not have it? Is reproducibility or transcendence stronger? It is no coincidental that in a society that learns from the tangible and turns its desires into the material, these bots generate confusion. But it won't be the first time for us to live in a collective hallucination. What kind of conversations will we have with each other when everything speaks to us? Where will we go in an anti-Somatic world? The need to convince ourselves of the existence of the abstract has been inverted. And soon we will have to convince the abstract that we are real once we know how to do it with each other. Let's embrace the dialectical surprise of finding ourselves with an alternative form of non-correspondence between the physical and the abstract world. There are people who argue that artificial intelligence is here to take their jobs. It is humans who humanize technology, but those who treat it as another human do not necessarily do it in the best way. How many times have we heard that argument against those who are seeking asylum outside of their country? price for being different when it seems possible, myth or condemnation when it is irreversible. We could call humanity to a condition where human characteristics are no longer an exclusive part of human beings. For artificial intelligences, human beings are mythological creatures. And this new construction is not the future. For those entities, it is the place where humans have fled from themselves. Those who think have nothing to fear because living in this strange world is what has made them creative. If, uh, as Einstein said, creativity is intelligence having fun, Hopefully, artifice is our nature taking a break. Since we chose the abstract to dominate our fear, many ideas died in the images where so many people do not walk. How not to celebrate the drill when everything's got tired of living, yet it fakes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina. Wonderful presentation. And I should say uh, last, but not least in our, sorry, in our uh, lineup here uh, is Vanessa Martins of Federal University of Juiz de, Flor de Fora, Brazil, presenting book clubs, technology and education, Paulo Freire and Marshall McLuhan for a media literacy approach in schools. Yes, I'm here. There Let you are. Just, yeah. <laughs> Let me just try to share my screen. 
because I am really horrible with Zoom, not use it to it. Um, yeah, <laughs> too much technology for me. Um, I hope you can see it. Oh, let me move here. Okay, I hope you can see it. Um, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Vanessa. I am from Federal University of Juiz de Fora in Brazil, also called UFJF, which is the abbreviation. Um, but I am currently in Toronto. Actually, these are my last hours here. I'm leaving in a few hours to the airport. But um, I thought that this was a great opportunity to present you my research, what I've been developing here in Toronto and in Brazil. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to have time, unfortunately, to listen to your comments, but I'll try to stay as long as I can because I think this is the time and the opportunity to share and hear what you have to say about this research that is being developed. Um, okay, so the name of the presentation is Books, Technology and Education, Paulo Freire and McLuhan for a Media Literacy Approach in Schools. But as I was probing and exploring, as Marshall McLuhan would say, I thought that another good title would be Book Literacy is the Foundation for, uh, for Digital Literacy, which is the kind of the abstract. I think this is the phrase that summarizes my thesis, but I'll let you decide <laughs> if I am right of, uh, or I am wrong. But I'm, um, um, I was a visiting student at St. Mike's College at the University of Toronto, and I developed uh, a research under Professor Robert Logan's um, supervisor. So these are some of the results. So, oops, yeah, I'm horrible at I don't think I can. Oops, what should I do now? How do I, oh, how can I, oh no. Yeah, too much technology. If it's, if it's okay, I, I will leave the, the screen like this. So um, the aim of this presentation is to outline some of the aspects of my thesis that's being developed. Um, and yeah, the action is a kind of um, action research, which I don't know if you are all familiar with these. Uh, it, it's actually, it's a kind of common thing in Brazil that is a combination of theory and analysis um, because it is something that Paulo Freire really um, believed that in order to do something, you must not just know theory, you just, you need to put it in practice. So um, I'll come back to Brazil in some hours and hopefully in some weeks, I'm going to apply everything that I learned and I've been doing and collecting here in a public high school in Brazil in a system of book clubs. So as I was exploring and analyzing, I came to the research problem, which is how the foundations of educommunication as formulated by Paulo Freire, together with the precepts of media ecology with a focus on McLuhan, can foster the acquisition of book literacy and, evaluate, uh, and eventually com uh, computer literacy. So, um, yeah, first I think I have to clarify what is educommunication because maybe um, <clears throat> some of you don't know because it's uh, more common in Latin America, but educommunication is the connection of education and communication. And Soares is Mar Soares, which is a real uh, famous and reference in Latin America for this study. He says that it is um, a field that aims to create communication ecosystems and creative spaces for education. It compromises the promotion of citizenship, the strengthening of living spaces, the expansion of the communicative potential of individuals and the groups for cultural and artistic practices. Um, so it has many um, 
way should be applied, not just in schools. And when we develop in school environments, the teacher is not the center of the communication, the center of the what is being taught, the center of the process, but he is rather a facilitator of the student's crit uh, critical consciousness. So it's like that famous phrases, the teacher is not a sage on the stage, but a guide on the side. So instead of giving the recipe, everything already done, everything already elaborated uh, for the activity, students, they are allowed to formulate it according to their desires, according to their interests, and based on collective constructions that are born from within each individual students, because everybody's different, everybody has their goals and objectives. So, <clears throat> To realize this objective, book clubs will be created in Brazil public high schools with more books being made available for these clubs than is now the case. We argue that for impoverished populations, the first step of media literacy is book literacy because you cannot be computer literate unless you are book literate. So the point is that um, I have already had contact, already been in the first public school that I'm going to um, be there with uh, the book club. And when I arrived there, I don't know if you are aware of public schools in Brazil, the situation was critical. As usual, they had no library, um, no books. So my first step was try to help them finding books. So I contact Rotary Club, for my city, and then we were able to raise about 200 books for them, which was really awesome because students really started reading. They they weren't reading because they didn't have access. Of course, there's a whole process of acquire, acquiring the taste, uh, the habit to start reading. But yeah, I had already started something. And also to know, because we can't say that all public schools in Brazil, everywhere, they are the same. Each public school, they have their similarities. So I had to be there to feel their problems, to feel their needs, so I can try to figure out what could be done. So I already had the first contact. So this is the name that we created for our book club, which in Portuguese is called Biblioteca Azul. In English, it's Blue Library. So the reason of the name, which the students already know, they are already like really cheering and excited about continuing the project. Um, the name is based on, now I have to forgive my French because I don't speak French, uh, Bibliotheque Blue, I'm sorry, please correct me after, <laughs> which is that literature that the printer produced pocket books, small books that could be sold in a real low value and talking about daily lives, things that people um, found um, during all the process daily, like even fairy tales or legends or recipes and kind of popular knowledge. So uh, the name is uh, based on this Bibliotheque Blue because of this and also because, because this kind of literature um, which is the reader mixing everything together with their daily lives, which is kind of the aim of these book clubs. Um, so the narrative and the students, they understand what is said there, but they also are able to connect what is in the literature, what is the narrative with their lives. Um, with their cities, with their word, so they can understand that um, everything has a purpose, so they have an awareness. This is why we chose um, this name because we thought that would be really appropriate. So I brought here uh, some photos of the starting project. So these are the students, uh, and these are some of the books because we received a lot. 
um, from Rotary. And when I come back, I will continue collecting books for the library. And something really interesting that caught my attention is that I received support from a publisher in Brazil and the publisher gave us, donated some wonderful fantasy boxes, collections of, of books. But unfortunately, the director of the school said that, no, we have to lock the door because the students, they are going to steal the books. And this is the problem <laughs> because if you think like this, you never change anything. And then when he told me this, I said, well, so why did I get the books? And if they steal the book, that's good because they're stealing a book. <laughs> they are not stealing like anything or do any harm. That's good. That's, that's a sign that they want to read. So don't do this. Just open the door and leave it at the library. So yeah, I know that I have a big um, path ahead. But it's something that's really mixed and connected to my life. And it's really stimulating me to continue. And um, I'm approaching the end. Um, this is something that was, is really important because this book club, this, this, um, this kind of methodology, this technique is not for them. I am trying to create something with them. Of course, I have some points. I'm trying to guide them. As I told you, no hierarchy. We are trying to create something together. And I asked them how and what they would like to have in this book club. So they answered me. Um, we tried to make it in a really fun way so they get interested because some students were uh, 18 years old. They never really ever read a book, a whole book. So it's it was like shocking. So I tried to involve them as much as I could. So here are some uh, of their answers. They tried to put anything that was connected to their daily lives. Like some of them wanted to connect to sports, um, songs, artistic things, um, manga, something connected to more participation of them so they can could be more active. So this is something that we started. And yeah, um, I tried to be like really fast, but I already have many results. And I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to come back. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> I'm trying to connect everything and I'm excited that I'm leaving Toronto and I can apply everything that I have acquired here. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Vanessa. Last time I saw you, you were about to leave for Toronto. Yeah, it's nice to see yeah. you on the other side. Yeah. And now I'm about to come back to Brazil. Yeah, uh, amazing, <laughs> amazing. I hope you had a good time. Yes, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, we have uh, we have considerable time really for questions and, and answers, questions and comments. Uh, anyone have questions for the panelists? Yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead, Milton. Um, who is in charge of education? Are the politicians in charge? Uh, in Brazil, yeah, but I mean, we are, now we are in a process that we just changed presidents and um, it used to be Bolsonaro. I don't know if you know what kind of problems we were having with Bolsonaro in education. And we are really hopeful with Lula now. So maybe many things are changing because Lula is uh, a really pro-education president. So yeah, uh -huh, the government. But as Brazil is a huge country and many departments, many bureaucracy, sometimes things they don't happen as they are supposed to happen. Like um, if the schools, public schools, they order the books at, um, that they want, sometimes they, we have huge delays. And when all the books arrive, like it's already the end of the year, and then they have to change the books and some of the books they go to trash. This is something that I all, all, uh, also criticize in my 
in my um, thesis that the huge amount of, for example, textbooks that they receive, which is um, bigger than the amount of um, students that we have. So, we ha so the schools, they, they have no place to storage these textbooks. So you have, so you see books in corridors everywhere and these books, they change like every year. So what do they do with this huge amount, this huge quantity of books, they just throw away. So it's a waste of money. So hopefully with um, things will, I mean, we are <laughs> trying to be positive. Things are going to change a bit. Thank you. Oh yes, please, Bob, go ahead. Um, Vanessa, what kind of access to technology um, are at those schools? Is there, although I am a big proponent of paper books, I, you know, perhaps electronic versions could work. Yeah, um, this is something that is really problematic in, in public schools. Uh, when I left Brazil, the whole school, which is a big school, they have like uh, 3,000 3, um, students. They had just eight computers working. And do we have, no, nah, it's nothing. And um, the classes, they are crowded. Some classes we have 40, like four zero students in a classroom. That's huge. The teacher even has space to move and interact with the students. So when I left, there were about eight working. Um, but um, at the end, um, last year, I started the beginning of the year. And then there was a promise that some computers would arrive. I left in September. They hadn't arrived either. And I already asked it, OK, did the computers arrive? No. So everything that we do, we have to share like one computer to 10 students. So it's really a matter of um, paper or maybe uh, use the technology that they have access because they have cell phones. They are um, aware of what to do if they don't have internet. I remember one day that I was in the class and I said, oh, I have no internet. And then one student said, okay, you can download this app and then you can have free inter internet for two hours and then don't worry. You just watch an ad and then after the ad, you have another two hours of internet. The thing is what I realized since the beginning of the pandemic is of course we have problems with technology, um, poor people, they don't have access, but the most problem is that what are, do they understand about this technology? Because access they have at home, but what they think about this, how, how, how do they deal with this? But when they enter schools, we have to like, do what we can. If we don't have computers at school, okay, this is a time that they are allowed to use their own cell phones and share the internet. So we, we have to be really creative as we don't have computers and no technologies at all. <laughs> Thank you. Other comments or questions? I have one for Marty. Uh, Marty, I wonder, since I think a number of you have probably inter interacted with you on, on the subject, um, but many of the others in, in our event today haven't, I wonder if you might say a couple words about how you see the role of satire in general semantics. You could expand a little further. Sure, thank you. Yeah, well, um, we'll take the first piece, lunch with the American people. Um, the American people is a high level abstraction. And of course, general semantics talks about high level abstractions as uh, something you need to be aware of um, that doesn't really get often to what is going on. As uh, Y used to say, we go, what is going on? Uh, it's, in politics, it's very normal for politicians to use high level abstractions, democracy, freedom, justice. And they scream to their supporters who somehow identified these words uh, with things they support, but we will support democracy, justice, and freedom. But what does it really mean? Uh, you know, the North Korea is the North Korean Democratic Republic. That's their official designation. Really? Are they? I mean, that's a, sort of an abstract term. But what does democracy mean to North Koreans? What does democracy mean, say, to Americans? Although that, that's kind of changing all the time. 
uh, but it both well, classically, what does democracy mean? Uh, but anyway, uh, I satirized lunch with the American people because um, constantly hearing American people, American people, as if as if the person saying that thinks they're saying something. But from a general semantic standpoint, we say, well, let's take it down or to the level of abstraction. Let's let's take it up to see what specifically you're talking about the American people. Well, are you talking about those on your side? Are you talking about specific segments of the American people that have appeal to what you're saying? So, uh, so that's certainly one thing. Um, you know, on the on the thing about the woke, um, uh, you know, there's there's certain take the woke jargon uh, for the most part um, in terms of general semantics. Um, you want to go beyond it. Uh, and and sort of boil down and also saying, well, if you use these particular descriptions, what specifically does that mean? And you could have a conversation getting past just sort of general descriptions. Uh, with this soil, I don't think so. It's the idea of assumptions. The general semantics, we're always looking to make better assumptions by applying the principles or the formulations of general semantics. Uh, and if you don't stop and think, delay your reaction. And certainly the people who were involved in the uh, insurrection on January 6th did not delay their reactions and think about, hmm, what happens if I do this? Do you think the government will get involved? Do you think I'll get arrested? Do you think I'll be prosecuted? Do you think I'll go to jail? They didn't do that. So, you know, I, I, I put this out there in a humorous sense, and, and I'm also using irony, in satires. But I really want people to think about the issues uh, that I'm raising. And it's on both sides. As I said, I, the reason I go after the woke and MAGA is I want to show that I can, you can use it both. It's not one side that has the answer to anything. Uh, and of course, we know in general semantics, there is no the answer. So anyway, those are just some uh, observations. Thank you very much. Also, in general semantics, there are probably no sides exactly, right? Yeah. Many yeah. sides, maybe. Right, many sides. Very good. Thank you very much. That's helpful. And Lance has his hand. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'd like to actually ask, combine two questions, um, but both around the topic of art. Um, and first for Zingara, because uh, you mentioned your visit to Frida Kahlo's house and uh I would just, you know, which I I also found very moving, and uh, I certainly recommend going there if you're ever in Mexico. Um, but I'd like to hear more about how that influenced your own work, uh, your own thought in in your study. And then for Gina, uh, on the topic of art, um, when it comes to AI, I mean, even before all the chatty stuff, there was a lot of concern and, and interest about AI produced artworks, uh, visual arts, and then and also AI produced music. Um, and so I'd like to know your thoughts about, about how, you know, about that, you know, because there's both uh, people who are fascinated and, and think this is great, a great development. Um, and in a sense, making the creation of art accessible to lots of people. Um, and then there are folks who are, um, you know, very upset about it and, you know, partly for copyright issues, but also, you know, you know, what is the role of artificially produced art in this sense, you know, and again, particularly going back to the juxtaposition with someone like Frida Kahlo, um, who was so creative as a, as a human being. So Zingara and then Gina, if you would, if you wouldn't be so kind. May I start, Gina? Gina? Yes. May I start? Yeah, okay, thank of you. Of course. Well, uh, I started to plant animals like fruits, but I had the feeling I'd like to plant something about women, but I didn't know how or what. And on the same year, I went to Mexico City. I had some knowledge about her Frida's life and her painting. But when I saw face to face, something changed in my mind. Uh, it's hard to explain, but it's not only about the colors or about how she painted, but it was about the subject. Uh, I saw many paintings, many panels about 
beauty about beautiful landscapes, beautiful sun, beautiful people, you know, happy people. But when I saw many uh, portraits about birth, about abortion, about her disease, you know, she had a really hard life. And I came back to Brazil, uh, buying many books of her. I was a fan, but right now I think I am a huge fan. Okay, about uh, your question, Lance. Um, well, I think new technologies um, were always part of art. Uh, in fact, we can think of a romance between art and technology. Um, since uh, Muybridge and Mare and the early um, 19th century, uh, 20th century, um, uh, we can think that um, there are always people who is pro and against. Of course, I think um, in this case um, with AIs, um, of course, there is the, a lot of concern regarding um, the copyright. Uh, but I think uh, in the art field and in the in culture in general, um, we've been replicating a lot lately. Even if you think uh, the bands, for example, be, be beyond the, the visual artists, I mean, but for example, let's take the case of uh, the music. Mm -hmm. um, how many people um, was born listening to a band and then they want to uh, create a band that sounds like that band and then they want to dress like the band. And uh, we are living in a, a kind of a matryoshka uh, 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 system, right? So now it's uh, uh, really interesting to see how these new technologies will affect all this, um, all the ways in which we were used to uh, to take to think about art, to think about culture. Since I don't think that art is about technique, uh, but it is about uh, going through um, a technique. I, I think it might be challenging and interesting to see what will happen. I'm curious about this. I'm curious too. <laughs> we'll we'll find out together. I think. Oh, yeah, of course. Every day there is a new uh, that shock us. Uh, we don't know if it's real, if it's not. And, and this is also interesting. May I say something from my perspective? Yes, please, please. Uh, for, for what, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, Gina, Gina said about art and technology. Uh, from my personal experience, this um, is very interesting because I'm a writer and my husband is a photographer and musician. So uh, we together worked in a multimedia project, which I've never worked before. I mean, he took my play and he, uh, he made pictures and video art and music on it. So it became a totally new work for my play because it was a theatrical play. And I think that there's always a way to incorporate new technologies in your work if you have the ideas and if you have the, um, the need to make art because this is very important that you, you have a genuine and original need of uh, saying something is not saying, but making something. So that... That uh, that was I want I wanted to say it was totally different from what I've done before, and it was um, a new a new work for for me and for for uh, for uh, him for my husband who was a photographer and and a musician and they they were all suddenly combined and made a new project which was all mixed up. And it was a very interesting experience. That's what I want to share with you. <laughs> thank you, uh, El Eleni. Is yes. <laughs> thank you, Eleni. And, and now I would like, before I, uh, we all leave, or I, leave, uh, I would like to invite you all to submit uh, your uh, presentation or your artwork uh, for the 20th anniversary of the 404 International Festival of Art and Technology. Um, mm. So uh, we are uh, doing the open call now. Uh, until May the 20th, so feel free to send us your proposal.
Thank, Thank you. you very much. Very kind. Tina, if you wouldn't mind putting a link maybe in the chat, yeah, that yes. would be very helpful. Right. Thank you. Thank you. It's a wonderful invitation. Mm -hmm. We still have about five minutes left for Q and A. Oh yeah, please, Alisa. Hi. Um. Yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me. On this um coming out of, I love that phrase, a matryoshka system. Coming out of that, and maybe thinking more about combining them. Curious uh, between listening to Marty and to uh, Vanessa. Vanessa, I'm curious about um, kind of like this holding the dynamic balance in conversational environments and coming off the um, polarities about the book club. I'm curious if we think of like the moderator or teacher and the relationship as sort of a, for me, a sacred trust as an educator working with children, or if I think of um, the trusted broadcaster in the US that um, Walter Cronkite was as I was growing up, sorry for the specific cultural reference, but a trusted, um, a, a, a shared common respect for the effect we have on each other in conversation and thought. Um, I'm curious about the book clubs. Were children reading the same books? Was there a space for mutual processing of information or were they all different books? Was the intention just to get children and books together? Hey, Lisa. Thank you for the question. Um, Actually, this is something. Um, actually, um, your 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 questions. I think they they lead to different points and things that I kept thinking about. Uh, first, the first point is the thing that you said about um, sacred trust, trust and respect. This is something that these two words that were really important to me. Um, for me, especially as uh, not I'm not a teacher of the school. Arriving them at uh, and interact with them, so I didn't let them know that I was a researcher or any kind of thing, so they could be like scared or didn't care about what I was doing. The first thing was not to impose it to them. I tried to captivate them. If you want to participate you participate. If you don't want, you don't participate. This is something really difficult because we have many difficulties, especially in public schools. And each group is a different group. I, I can't say that everything that I do in a certain group for the first year of high school, for another group of first year high school is going to be the same because it's not ever going to be the same. They all have different characteristics. But uh, when I arrived, um, I try to follow the school rules, which is we can't allow students leave the room because they technically are in the classroom. Because uh, I don't know if you have abroad in other countries, like in Brazil public schools, they created a system of special classes. It's a class that um, the teacher has the opportunity to develop what he or she wanted to teach, focus on career or life outside the school. Because sometimes when they reach the last year of the high school, they already do their jobs. They don't have the opportunity to go to universities. So this space, this class, it's not a class, it's a kind of interaction that they have this opportunity. So this book club is made for this space where it's a kind of more liberty. We don't have roles, we try to do a circle. So you have a kind of more intimate atmosphere where we can all see each other's face. So when I entered the class, I tried not to impose to them, but as they had to stay at the room because they can't leave the room, they get curious. They are teenagers, they want to talk. They want to say, I don't agree with you, especially because they are interacting with friends. So they 
at the time that I was there, 100% that didn't want to participate end up wanting to participate, even though not in the same level as others, but it's a kind of participation. And the main goal is like this, to know, to think outside of the already thinking, to, to know how to interact. Okay, I have a point of view, you have your point of view. So we are trying to look for patterns because if you hold a point of view, it's just you, holding a point of view, but if you try together to find patterns in the subject, you are doing it collectively. You are not doing it alone. So we are trying to find patterns. And yeah, um, it's difficult because they also have problems in their houses because sometimes they go to school just to eat. They don't have food in their houses. So we have to try to mix it like this class, um, that I was with them in the book club, it was the first period. Many of them arrived late in the class because they were having breakfast in, at the school. So this is something that I had to, okay, I can't be mad at them if they arrive and if they are eating, at least they arrive and they don't want to interact. So uh, this is something like, I'm not going to stay forever at the school, of course not. I'm there not just as a researcher, I'm there to also try to do something for my community. And after um, all the teachers that everything that we created together, they can for some moment, I hope like for a good amount of years, they can continue what uh, we created together. And there is a platform, uh, our government has a platform that you can register the projects that you do. So the project is already registered there. So people from all over the country got to know what we did, what were the results. So we hopefully have the chance to more people um, understand and try to do similar things. But yeah, trust is respect is something that we have to constantly try to I just yeah. uh, if I could just in, if I could just interrupt we're we're, we're actually um, past time so I, I, I need to at least give I, I need to I need to give at least give people a chance to take their break and arrive back here at three oh, okay. but if we'd like to continue having a conversation certainly we can do a second part and I saw that Laura also had her hand up so maybe there's a couple people that would like to have sure. the floor a little bit to ask some questions so Lisa you can certainly do a little follow up and sure. Laura can, can go I, ahead I after. Yes, I just want to say that my follow up is for Marty, because when there are these great needs to be spoken of in systems, I'm really trying to find a way to be um, a better storyteller and a little more tongue in cheek. So people just don't get discouraged and go back to the polar uh, entrenched myopic view. So that's what I'll leave in the break. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. Sure, of course. Did you so, want to give Laura a chance just to- Yeah, yeah, Laura, would you like to say something? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, this is a question for Gina. And um, I found very interesting what you said about uh, what the artificial intelligence do, uh, about uh, the creation or uh, doing uh, new things. So my question is, uh, if you think that the artificial intelligence make art, and if not, which uh, is the difference between what uh, between the things humans do and the artificial intelligence? Uh, hello, hola, Laura. <laughs> hello. Hola, um, thank you. <laughs> we speak Spanish. Um, well, uh, if uh, an AI can make art or not, I think uh, art is a part of a uh, humans, basically but we don't know where it will go, where these developments, uh, what, what can they achieve? Um, I think it's what, what, what it's interesting to think is that um, they build from what we live, uh, for, from, uh, from our trace online. So it's like they are giving back what, uh, what we send uh, to, this, to the big cloud, to the database. Um, but um, about um, an artwork, I've seen 
that a lot of people is complaining um, because they are afraid of losing their jobs in, in the way that a lot of illustrators or some people that were so proud of themselves uh, using the, the best way, the tools, the best way, the softwares, like technical um, uh, the 3D modelers, uh, for example, uh, the animators, the illustrators. Um, and since I don't think that um, uh, many things that people think that art, I don't agree with it, you know, because I just think that it's beautiful technically, um, but uh, it, if, if it's, it's just about how well it's done, uh, it, it could be a nice painting, it could be a nice illustration, but not necessarily it will be an artwork. So I think uh, it, this opens the debate, um, which I celebrate uh, the, this uh, the opening the, the, the discussion. And uh, it brings us uh, again to think, to rethink what is art after all? And what are we doing with our art notions uh, since we are applying these technologies? I think maybe I replied to your question. Have yes, you thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Gina. No, thank you. Gracias. Okay, uh, we're gonna take take that ten minute break and start at the top of the hour uh, in our, for our last third of the symposium. Thank you all. Thank you.